All right. Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Bible Baptist Church and our Sunday evening service. I uh, hope you all had a good afternoon and then glad you came back to be with us again tonight. And uh, the, the Bible says in Psalms chapter number 89, verses 1 through 3, that I will sing of the mercies of the Lord forever. With my mouth will I make known thy faithfulness to all generations. For I have said, mercy shall be built up forever. Thy faithfulness shalt thou establish in the very heavens. I have made a covenant with my chosen. I have sworn unto David my servants. And so tonight the choir is going to sing an opener entitled, I will sing of the mercies. Grab your hymnals and we'll continue singing tonight to the Lord. We'll grab and turn to page 402. Page 402, we'll sing the first, the second, and the last verse of faith is the victory. And when you find that, if you're able, go ahead and stand with me as we sing. Yes, sir. Camped along the hills of mighty Christian soldiers rise and press the battle ere the night shall veil the glowing skies against the foes and veils below. Let all our strength be hurled. Faith is the victory we know that overcomes the world. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world on the second. His banner over us in love, our sword, the word of God. We tread the road, the saints above, with shouts of triumph trod. By faith they like the whirlwind's breast, we bore every fear. The faith by which they conquered death. Is still our shining shield. Faith is the victory. Faith is the victory. Oh, glorious victory that overcomes the world. And sing out on the last. To him that overcomes the foe, white raiment shall be given. Before the angels he shall know his name confessed in heaven. Then onward from the hills of light, our hearts with love aflame, will banish all the hopes of night in Jesus' conquering name. Faith is the victory, faith is the victory, oh glorious victory that overcomes the world. Well, we picked back up just a little bit in the morning service in our attendance this morning, and that was great to see. And we thank all of you for being here tonight. Um, as it is our custom, we will, the last Sunday night of every month, we do a treasurer's report, but we'll do that after we go offline. And um, we appreciate those that are watching by live streaming. And we had some first-time visitors today, so we're glad about that. And so let's all be a witness. Let's invite people to church. Let's speak up for the Lord. You never know. Uh, we had a young girl that rode the bus and came to church here many years ago. She was a bus kid. Into her teen years, she came faithfully to the church. And uh, 
She's now 45 or something, close to 50 years of age. And she sent our daughter a message on Facebook and said that this was the church where she learned about Jesus, where she learned about the Bible being the Word of God, where she memorized the books of the Bible. And her first knowledge of God and His Word and salvation came because of coming here when she was a young girl. And uh, I hear that occasionally. And uh, I had a girl call me one time, wanted to know was I still the same pastor that was here when it was on Main Street. And I said, yes, ma'am. And, and she said, well, I rode the bus and came to church there when I was a little girl. You know, I said, you baptized me in the river. I said, yeah, in Lake Wiley, you sure did. You know, we baptized a whole bunch of you back in those days in the lake. We didn't have a baptistry in the building we were in. And uh, uh, I'll never forget Dolores' aunt, Maxine, said, uh, I preach a parish, I want you to baptize me in the river. I said, okay, Maxine, I was, she said, but I'm scared of what? I said, well, that's okay. I, you, you don't have to worry. I'll be right there with you. You know, she said, but I'm a big woman now. I said, I know, but I, when I put you on top of the water, you hardly weigh anything. You know, I won't have a problem at all picking you back up. And she said, no, you're not going to lose me, are you? I said, no, ma'am, I won't lose you. <laughs> There's some comical things happen around the baptistries. And, uh, but we're thankful that uh, the church has got a history that people can remember coming here they remember the bible is taught they remember the preaching of salvation they remember many were saved here and baptized here and have gone on in their life you know other places around the world so um, thankful to all of you for your effectiveness in teaching sunday school and junior church and the wednesday night program and the bus route and all that we do that reaches out in evangelism to others and thank you for having a part in that and um Let's pray and ask the Lord to bless those that are sick and in need tonight. Remember Carol Nelson, who uh, hopefully she's getting over COVID. And uh, pray for her and any others that are on our list, a long, long list with folks with serious illnesses. And uh, be sure to read over that during the week and pray for folks. Father, thank you for your love and mercy to us. Thank you for your word. Thank you for salvation in the person of Jesus Christ. Thank you he died on the cross to pay for our sins that we can be saved. Thank you that you love us and gave your son for us. Thank you, Lord, for all these folks who love you and that come out to church to worship and to grow in the faith. We pray you'll bless them tonight and give Jacob recall of what he studied and prepared. And bless the song service now in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus, my Lord.
way, do you belong to Jesus? The Bible says that he's purchased us with his blood, but the only way you can belong to him is if you've accepted his blood and accepted his sacrifice for your sins. So we pray that if you do not know that today, you come, as Pastor mentioned this morning, you come talk to me, come talk to Pastor, one of our deacons. We'd love to show you how you can know for sure that you belong to Jesus. If you have your hymnals, grab them one more time. We'll turn to page 504. And we'll sing Sweet By and By. When you find it, go ahead and stand if you're able. And we'll sing all three verses of Sweet By and By, page 504. 504. There's a man that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way. To prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore in the sweet by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. We shall sing on that beautiful shore The melodious songs of the blessed And our spirit shall sorrow no more Not a sigh for a blessing of rest In the sweet by and by We shall meet on that beautiful by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore, to our bountiful Father above, we will offer a tribute of praise, for the glorious lift of His love, and the blessings that hallow our days. Thank you, maybe see it. I hope you all are having a good evening. Uh, don't forget that if you're a lady and you want to go to the ladies' conference, we do still have the sign-up sheet out in the lobby. It's November 5th and 6th, and so we'd like for you to come if you're able to. It's up at Gospel Light, and it's always a good time. And so if you're a lady and you'd like to go to that, please sign the sign-up sheet in the lobby. Um, James, I don't know if they qualify as a lady or not, but we can, if they want to go, we can let them go. Um, you can drive the bus if you get your CDL. <laughs> um, we're always looking for CDL drivers. So um, please play for some of our, for our families that are traveling too. We've had some teen folks um, been traveling too, and just pray for them as they're traveling back and forth, going down to Pensacola to see if they want to go to college down there. And so uh, it's a great place to go to school, and I'm praying for our, our teens daily as they're my responsibility to shepherd them and to feed them. And I, and I hope uh, that when they graduate, they don't just leave church and never come back. It's my goal that they are grounded enough by the time they leave our youth group that they will continue in church long after they've graduated. And so pray for them for that. If you uh, have your Bibles, turn with me to Colossians chapter number 2. Colossians chapter number 2. Starting in verse number six, uh, the Bible says, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and builded up in him and established in the faith, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. The other, uh, the other night, a couple weeks ago, Brother Dick Clark brought a message and he preached from Micah chapter number 6 and verse number 8, which says, he, sh he has showed thee, O man, what is good. And what doth the Lord require thee but to do justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with thy God. And as he preached about those three topics of doing justly and loving mercy and walking humbly with God, I just kind of over the next few weeks, I just started thinking to myself and studying throughout Scripture, well, what is we what constitutes or what steps do we need to take to have a good walk with God? Because we are to walk humbly with our God, but what helps us, what's going to make us have a good walk with God? What's going to make us have a close walk with God? And I began to study Colossians. I began to study Bible characters throughout uh, the the Bible, and I, what I found is that those who walk closely with God, those who walk humbly with God, are the people in the Bible and the people throughout history who accomplish the most for God. They're the ones that saw great and mighty miracles happen. They're the ones that accomplished great fe- feats and had great victories when others did not. And I truly believe that the difference between a victorious Christian and just an average Christian who sees no victory in their life, who sees no fruit in their life, is how you walk with God. And the Bible says in Colossians chapter number 2, verse number 6, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him. As I was studying throughout Scripture, I began to think about men who walked with God. And the first man that came to mind was Enoch. You know, it is early on in the Bible, you find Enoch, and the Bible says in Genesis chapter number 5, verse number 24, that Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. And if you don't know what that means, what basically what it means is Enoch walked so closely with God and so humbly with God that he escaped death. He didn't die. God just took him off the planet. And how many of y'all would like to escape death? I would love to escape that. I want to live my whole life, and then I want God to just take me before I die. That would be fantastic. And Enoch is one of the only human beings who has ever escaped death, and one of the reasons why is because he walked with God. You go a little farther in Scripture, and you find in Genesis chapter number 6, you find a man named Noah who walked with God in a society when no one else did, who fellowshiped with God when All his friends, all his neighbors forsook God and did what was right in their own eyes. And the Bible says, because Noah walked with God, it was counted unto him for righteousness. And he and his family were spared from the flood to come. And he knew to build an ark and his family was saved from the wrath of God. You continue on and you find Abraham, a man who walked so closely with God that God actually called Abraham his friend. And you study the life of Abraham and you find how God on multiple occasions came to Abraham's home and ate with him and talked with him and fellowshiped with him. And to one point where when he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord said, can I hide what I'm going to do from Abraham? He said, he, and basically I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but he came to the conclusion, no. And he shared with Abraham how he was going to go down to Sodom and how destruction was coming. And Abraham said, well, would you spare the city then if there was just, Ten righteous men. God said, I would, and there wasn't. And But Abraham had that relationship with God where he could fellowship with him, where he could plead with him for other people, and it was because he walked with God. Because Abraham walked with God, he was given the promised land. The Bible says that God told him to leave his home, to leave his country, and by faith, Abraham left his own home, left his family behind, and went to a country he knew not where it was. But he knew whose builder it was, and it was God's. Abraham was given the promised seed that through his seed, through his line, through Israel, the Messiah would come. Abraham saw many great things because he walked with God. You go on to Moses, and Moses is personally one of my favorite characters. He saw some of the most incredible things you could ever see as a human being. He saw the ten plagues come on Egypt. He saw a bush burning that was not consumed and the Lord speaking to him. He was given the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, and and he was up there with God for so long that he came down and they had to put a veil over his face because he was it was too bright. They didn't they didn't want to look at him. I guess they didn't have sunglasses in that time, so they made their own. They covered his face, and it was because Ab- or because Moses walked with God that he was able to experience that. He saw the Red Sea part, and uh, Brianna says that's one of if she could go back to any part in time, that's where she would go back in time to to see the Red Sea part, and I. Truly believe that would be an incredible sight to behold. He wandered around the wilderness, which would be not so incredible, but he got to do it. And he was fed with manna from heaven. 
His shoes didn't wear out. They got water from a rock. And if you know anything about rocks, I ain't getting water out of a rock. If I speak to a rock, it's not giving me water. And if I hit a rock, it's not getting me water. But Moses got water from a rock, all because he walked with God. You go on to David, a man after God's own heart. And David, David has some great victories. He has some failures as well. But David was a man who killed Goliath with just a sling and a stone. Just a little boy with a stone and a little toy sling, and he kills a giant that the entire nation of Israel were afraid of. He was a man that killed a lion and a bear with his bare hands. We used to watch Davy Crockett as little kids, and you grin down a bear, you know, and kill him. But David killed it with his bare hands. And he did it because he walked with the Lord, and the Lord was with him, and everywhere he went, God was with him. And when God was with him, no one could stand against him. And if you and I want to see God work in our lives, if you and I want to see God work in this church and we really truly want to make a difference in our communities, what it's going to take is a close, personal, humble walk with God, just like these men had. And so what allows us to have a walk with God? What are some steps we need to take in order to have a real personal walk with God, in order to, as Colossians puts it, to walk in him? to walk humbly with our gods. Well, number one, in order to have a relationship with God, in order to have a walk at all, you must first accept Christ as your Savior. Now, we've, we hear this all the time, especially if you're in church. You heard a great uh, layout of the gospel and salvation this morning during the morning service. But the Bible teaches that whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also, 1 John 2.23. And if you think that verse through, basically what it's teaching is this. If you deny Jesus, you do not have God the Father. If you deny Jesus, you do not know God the Father, and you cannot commune with God the Father. But if you accept Jesus, if you profess Jesus to be the Christ, if you accept him into your lives and believe that he is the son of God and that he died for your sins, was buried and rose again from the grave, then, then you have the father. Then you have communion with him. Then your sins are, for, be, are forgiven. There's only one name given among men, whereas you must be saved, and that is Jesus Christ. And so the first step for all of us to have a close personal walk with God and know God is to first know Jesus Christ as our savior. And I would urge you, if you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, to make sure you know him tonight before you go home. You're not promised another moment. You're not promised another day. You're not even promised to hear me finish my message. You may die. You may be like, I may be preaching like Paul. I'm long-winded. You may fall off the pew and just hit your head and die tonight. I don't know. And I don't have the power to raise you up from the dead. But I would urge you to trust Christ as your Savior. The Bible says that if you confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. And the first step to having a walk with the Lord is accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. The second step, so to speak, there's many things that go into having a close walk with God, but one of the key things, I believe, is developing an appetite for righteousness. If you would, flip over with me to Matthew chapter number 5. Matthew chapter number 5 and verse number 6. The Bible says, and these words are in red, it's Jesus speaking. And Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I'll read that again. He says, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. And I want you just for a moment to, right there in your seat, think about all the things you long for and you hunger for in life. Maybe it's physical food. I know we all long for that. Maybe it's a cold glass of Dr. Pepper. Maybe it's, maybe it's, maybe it's for acceptance. Maybe it's for power. Maybe it's for a nicer home, money, cars, whatever the case may be, just think in your mind the things in life you long for, the things in life you desire. Maybe it's a relationship. I don't know. We were talking to the teens the other night and talking about things you need to desire, and most of them desire to be in a relationship at some point. And we desire things, but now let me ask you another question. On that list of things you desire, is righteousness one of them? You see, for many in the world, 
the things of God and righteousness is not something they desire. They don't desire to live for God. They don't desire to read their Bibles. They don't desire to come to church. They don't desire to share the gospel. They desire anything else but that. And they long for acceptance. They long for uh, happiness. They long for peace, but yet they search for it in everything else besides God. But Jesus said, blessed are they which do hunger and thirst for, in other words, long for righteousness. And then he gives a promise. He says, for they shall be filled. And, you know, I got to think about that. I got to think about people I went to high school with and and how they don't really seem to be satisfied in life right now or even look at movie stars. They seem miserable all the time. They, they have it all. They have everything the world could offer, but yet they're not satisfied with where they are. And the reason why is because they have a hunger for everything, everything other than righteousness. But when you hunger for righteousness, when you thirst for righteousness, the Bible says you shall be filled. In, in, um, in high school, we... we playing football, they would have a motivational speaker come and speak all the time. And one day for workouts, our coach sat us down and he showed us a video by a man named Eric uh, Thomas. And I don't advocate for everything he says, but this video stuck with me. And in this video, he gave a story about a young man who wanted to be rich. It was all he wanted in life. He wanted to be successful. He wanted to be a CEO. He wanted to live the nice life, the high life. And he finds this older gentleman who, who was a pretty successful guy. And he goes up to him and he says, hey, I want to be like you. I want to make money like you. I want to be successful like you. I want to be where you are in life. How do I accomplish it? The older man said, well, if you want to be like me, then I'll meet you tomorrow morning at the beach, 4 a.m. The guy said, the beach? He's like, I don't want to go swimming. I just want to learn how, I want to learn how to be successful. I want to learn how to make money. And the guy said, if you want to learn how to make money, I'll meet you tomorrow, 4 a.m. Don't be late. Next day comes, 4 a.m. comes around. The man is up ready at the beach. He's ready to go. He's got a suit on. He should have wore swimming trunks, but he wore a suit. He was ready to go, ready to learn. And the old man said, are you, how bad do you want to be successful? The kid said, I want to be successful really bad. That's all I want in life. That's what I want. He said, okay, if you want to be successful, walk out into the water. He's kind of scratching his head, but he walks out into the water, and he walks till he's about waist deep. And he turns back around, and the old man says, go out a little farther. He's thinking, a little, a little farther? I'm in a suit. I didn't come to swim. I wanted to learn. He said, go out a little farther. He goes out a little farther. He's shoulder level now. And in his mind, he's thinking, this, this older guy is crazy. Or maybe he's trying to kill me. I don't know, but he's crazy. He's rich, but he's crazy. Old man says, if you want to be successful keep walking. Now he's, now he's frustrated. He's, he's up to his mouth level. And he, he looks back and he looks at the man. He says, look, I don't know how you got successful. And I, you may be a smart guy, but I'm done. I'm done with this. I'm not walking any further. The guy said, I thought you wanted to be successful. He says, I do. He says, then just walk out a couple more steps. He walks out a couple more more steps. Now it's covering his nose, and the old man grabs him by the back of the neck, shoves his head in the water, and just holds him under. Just holds him. The kid at this point is fighting. He's clawing naturally like anybody else would do. He's trying to fight. He's trying to get up, and the old man's stronger than him. He's just holding him under. He keeps holding him under. He keeps holding him under. And just before the young man was about to pass out, he lets him up for air. He's gasping. He's trying to collect himself. And he said, what did you do that for? And the old man said, I have one question for you. When you were underwater, what did you want? Somebody help me out. What did he want? Hey, he wanted to live. He wanted air. The only thing he wanted when he was underwater was air. And the old man looked at him and he said, if, when you want to be successful, as bad as you just wanted to breathe, then you'll be successful. And can I just say, Eric Thomas used that as a motivational speak for what it takes to be successful. But I truly believe that in Matthew chapter number five, verse number six, Jesus is giving the same kind of speech on what it takes to be spiritually filled. And what he's saying is, listen, 
If you want to be spiritually filled, if you want to know me as badly as you want to eat food when you're hungry or drink water when you drink, or in this case, breathe air when you cannot breathe, then you'll be spiritually filled. And, you know, I, as I look around in my personal life or even in other Christians' life, what I find is that many Christians say they want to know God. Many Christians say they want to have a relationship with God, but they don't want it that bad. We don't want it as bad as we want to be accepted. We don't want it as bad as we want that promotion at work. We don't want it as bad as we want to take trips. And I'm not advocating against trips. I love trips. But we don't want to know God as badly as we want to travel the world sometimes. And what Jesus is saying in Matthew chapter number five, verse number six is, if you want to know me, if you want to be spiritually filled, if you want to have a close walk with me, then you must hunger and thirst after righteousness. You ever seen somebody have an asthma attack? In that moment, when they're having an asthma attack, do you think they care about anything other than what can help me breathe? Does anybody? No, all they care about is how can I breathe? Because if I don't breathe, I'm going to die. And as Christians tonight, I would encourage you to develop an appetite so strongly for the things of God, so strongly for the word of God that you can't move throughout your day until you're fed. You can't go on in your life until God has spoken to you. Because if you desire it that strongly, if you want it that strongly, I promise you, you'll find the Lord. I promise you, he'll speak to you. I wrote down the psalmist said in give me a second. The psalmist said in Psalms chapter 119 verse number 10. Uh, the psalmist said this, he says with my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh let me not wander from thy commandments. And Jeremiah 29:13 says and ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search for me with your whole heart. Have you found God lately? Has he spoke to you lately? If not, if you're one of those sitting here tonight that says, you know, to my shame, I have not heard God lately. Can I ask you a question? Have you searched for him with your whole heart? Do you long for it? Do you have an appetite for righteousness? For the things of God, to, um, for, uh, Peter tells us in First Peter chapter number two, verse number two, that as newborn babes, we are to desire the sincere milk of the word, that we may, that ye may grow thereby. And Isaiah says, "So shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth; it shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing where I send it." We ought to, as Christians, we ought to desire or long for the things of God. And what are the things of God? What do those include? Well, number one, the word of God. You ought to have an appetite or a hunger or a thirst to be filled with the word of God. You ought to have an appetite. You ought to have a thirst to be in the house of God. I mean, COVID hit, and and one of the first things you missed, if you're like me, was being in church because you desired to be around other Christians. But you know, unfortunately, they we're seeing a lot of Christians who don't really desire that. They don't have a long, they don't have a hunger, they don't have a priority on being in church. So it drifts by the wayside. We should dev- desire prayer. We are to pray without ceasing. And the only way to pray without ceasing is if you desire to pray. To consistently pray, as I taught the teens on Wednesday night. We ought to have a desire to share the gospel with others. The Bible says, or or Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he gives the Great Commission. and, and, And what I learned over and over and over again at West Coast when I was there is, as Christians, we ought to make God's last command our first priority. We ought not to let that fall by the wayside. We should desire to share the gospel with others. And if we do, if we, the Bible says, they that sow in tears shall reap in joy. And you know, if we desire the things of God, God promises us, Jesus promises us that we shall be filled. Not only do we need to develop an appetite for the things of righteousness to be spiritually filled, but then thirdly, 
we must learn to sacrifice as well. And personally, I find this one very difficult. <laughs> sacrifice is not easy, is it? It's not easy to sacrifice. But yet, we must learn to sacrifice if we want to have a relationship and a walk with God. You know, so many Christians say, I want to know God. I want to live for God. But I'm not willing to give that up. I'm not, I, let me go back and do these things first, and then God, I'll give you my life. But God says, no, those things can wait. You can leave those things behind. They're temporal. They're earthly. Follow me. See, most of us want to know God, but we'd rather sleep than read our Bibles. Most of us want to know God, but we'd rather watch, in my, my opinion, in, in my life, I'd rather watch football than get on my knees or pray or to go outdoor knocking if a football game is on because I just love it that much. Most of us want to know God, but we'd rather maybe eat a little more than to go to know, talk to God, to walk with God. But if we want to know God, if we want to walk with God, if we want to have a relationship with him, what it's going to take is some sacrifice. It's going to take giving up some sleep, maybe getting up earlier in the morning to find the Lord, maybe staying up a little later than you normally do just to fit in that prayer time so that you don't miss it that day. It's going to take giving up some things that you thought you might need, but they weren't more, more important than the word of God. So you cast those out so you could talk to God. And what are some things we must sacrifice? Well, number one, we must sacrifice sin in the flesh to know God. Did you know that your iniquities separate you from God? And the Bible says, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. And if you're harboring sin in your life, there's no relationship with God. There's no walking with God. He won't even hear your prayers. It's why Peter said in 1 Peter chapter number 2, verse number 11, he said, Dearly beloved, I beseech you or I beg you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust which war against the soul. Peter's talking to these Christians, and he's ta- and as I'm, the last time I preached, I preached through first, uh, first Peter, and he's talking to Christians who are scattered, Christians who are going through persecution. And what he says is, hey, Christians, listen, listen, I beg you, I'm, just, I'm begging you, stay away from sin. Stay away from fleshly lust. Stay far away from it. Avoid it like the plague. Avoid it like the coronavirus because it's going to destroy you because you cannot, and I repeat, you cannot serve God and hold on to sin. You can't. You may want to. You may find your sin fun. Even the Bible says that there's pleasure in sin for a season. But if you're going to serve God, if you're going to live for God, if God's going to use you to do great and mighty things like he did so many people throughout history, you're going to have to sacrifice your desire to sin. And as Paul put it, our flesh only desires to sin. He says, I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And I was talking to a guy the other day, and he just said, I can't, I can't seem to stop wanting to sin. And I said, well, are you saved? He said, no. I said, well, there's your problem because you don't have a spirit living in you that gives you the ability to stop sinning. The fleshly spirit's not going to stop sinning ever. That's what it longs for. In my flesh dwelleth no thing. And if I feed my flesh daily, if I don't have God's spirit living in me, I have no hope to overcome sin. I can try as hard as I want, but unless God's working in my life, I cannot overcome sin. But when we crucify our flesh, with God, when we give it to him and lay it at the cross, then we'll see victory. Then we'll see God work. Jesus said in Luke chapter number nine, you can turn there if you want. Luke chapter number nine, verse number 23. Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. I'll read it one more time, but this is Jesus speaking. And he says, if any man will come after me, and what he's saying is, if anybody's going to follow me, if you're going to walk with me, if you're going to live for me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Now, what are we denying? Well, we're denying our desires. We're, den- we're denying our flesh. We're denying our hopes and dreams. And that's not to say that God won't give you your hopes and dreams. It's just to say that I'm not putting my hopes and dreams above what God has asked me to do. And die daily. Take up, take up your cross daily. 
What, what, what was a cross? A place of death. Did you know, besides Jesus, I don't think there's anybody in history who did not escape or who did not die on the cross. Even Jesus died on the cross, but he rose again from the dead. Every single person that went to the cross died. It was a place of death. It was ultimate death. There was no exception to the rule. Everybody that went to the cross died. And what Jesus is saying is, if you want to follow me, deny you got to take up your cross daily. you got to die daily. Paul understood this very well. He, he, told, the, the, he told the Christians in, um, in Corinth, he says, I die daily. And I, can I ask you something? When's the last time you died? When's the last time you died to your desires? When's the last time you died to your flesh? For some of us, it's probably a long time. And you wonder why God's not working. You wonder why you haven't seen God talk to you. You wonder why you haven't seen God work in your life. And the reason why is because you are not taking up your cross daily and dying to self. We must sacrifice our flesh and our desire to sin on the altar. But not just that, we must also sacrifice or give up the weights in our life. Hebrews chapter number 12, verse number 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we are, are also compassed, com, compass, sorry, about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We, we all know what sin is. Sin is anything we think, anything we say, or anything we do that disobeys or breaks God's law. But what are weights? The fact that Hebrews chapter number 12 says, let us lay aside every weight and the sin tells me that a weight is not necessarily a sin. It's not necessarily something wrong. A weight, and this is my definition, but a weight, according to what I believe the Bible is teaching, is anything that is holding you back or holding you down, so to speak, from being what God has called you to be. You see, if you put a weighted vest on, it's going to hold you down. It's going to hold you back. And what Hebrews is telling us is not only do we need to lay aside the sins, not only do we need to sacrifice the flesh, but we need to set aside some weights in our lives. Some good things, some things that are not necessarily wrong, but when they're in your life, they're holding you back from what God wants you to be. And maybe that's a desire for a promotion. Maybe that's a weight that's holding you back from being what God wants you to be. Maybe it's sports. For me, it was sports. Sports was a weight that was holding me back from what God wanted me to be. Maybe it's money. Maybe your love of money is holding you back from what God wants you to be. Maybe it's this cell phone, because you know cell phones can cause a lot of harm if you don't use them properly. And it's holding you back. It's keeping you back from giving your life to God. Maybe it's some friends that you have. For whatever reason, you hang out with them, you spend time with them, and the last thing on your mind when you're with them is the things of God. And you know, there's nothing wrong with having friends. There's nothing wrong with hanging out and, and going out to eat. But if, if those people are keeping you back from being all that God wants you to be, my friends, that is a weight in your life that you need to get rid of. I don't, just to share a little bit of my story, when I was a senior in high school, all I cared, well, actually, when I was in high school in general, all I cared about was sports. And all I wanted to do was go pro. I just, I wanted to be Tom Brady. That's all I wanted to do. I want to go pro. And so every waking day of my life, it was work out, practice, study plays, and be the best I could at football. I even worked out double. I worked out with the school, and then I got a personal trainer, and I worked out with them too. And all my life in high school was dedicated to being in sports, dedicated to being the best I could be. And my senior year came, and God took sports away from me. I won't go into all the details, but literally, I didn't have a choice in the matter. God basically said, you're not playing sports anymore. I'm not going to let anybody even let you play sports. So my senior year, I didn't play a single sport. And if you knew me back then, that was, that was hard. I couldn't play basketball my senior year. I couldn't play baseball. I couldn't play football. I just got to sit in school, come home, and watch other people talk about sports. And that was tough. And to be honest with you, I was angry at God. I was mad at him. But, you know, looking back now, I am so thankful he took football away. I'm so thankful he took sports away because instead of giving all my time to sports, my senior year, I got to come to church more. Instead of giving all my time to sports, my senior year, I got to go to the wilds where Dr. Shetler preached and God called me to go into the ministry. 
And, you know, none of that would have ever happened if he did not take football away from me. And you know what? I got called into the ministry. I went to West Coast, and I met my wife. I would have never met Brianna if God didn't take football away from me. And that's hard. It's hard to sacrifice. It's hard to give up things. It's hard to say, God, you take it away because it's not making me who I should be. It's painful. I'm crying. (laughs) But when you give it up, when you lay the weights aside, you say, God, listen, I know this isn't necessarily wrong, but it's not helping me be who you want me to be. Just watch what God will do because he will transform your life into something you never dreamed of. Another weight for me was uh, social media. It was holding me back. And I decided to get rid of it. It was kind of ruining my life, so to speak. I got rid of all social media. And I can tell you what, God has begun to work on my life ever since I got rid of it. And he's turning me, I'm not anywhere close to the man I want to be, but he's turning me into somebody that he wants me to be. And I'm glad for that. And I would challenge each one of you to search your life, search your soul, and find the weights in your life that are holding you back and have the courage to set them aside and to give them to God. And then finally tonight, to have a good walk with God, to have a close walk with God, it's going to take some discipline. Some discipline. And this is where a lot of us fail We fail to have the discipline it takes to keep going. But 1 Corinthians chapter number 15, verse number 58, Paul challenges the church and he says, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast and unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as ye know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. He says, be steadfast and unmovable. Can I ask you something? Are those two words words that characterize your life and your walk with God? Are you steadfast? Are you unmovable? Are you always abounding in God? Or are you carried about with every wind of doctrine? Are you carried about with every feeling that comes through your body? Listen, the Christian life is not about feelings. The Christian life is about what God says. And if God says it, you do it regardless of how you feel. We ought to be Christians who stand strong, who are rooted in Scripture and go forward for God. It's going to take discipline to walk with Him. It takes discipline to get up in the morning and talk to God. It takes discipline to stay up at night and talk to God. It takes discipline to go witness to your neighbor even though you don't really want to. It takes discipline to stay for God. And I would encourage you tonight, be disciplined, be steadfast, be unmovable. Don't be those Christians who make a New Year's resolution and then a week later, because some, something came up in your life, you just let that slip by the wayside. Make decisions for God, and when you make decisions for God, determine you in your heart to follow through, to walk with Him. I'll, I'll close with this poem, and then Miss Lynette will come. But it's entitled, Don't Quit. And it says, when things go wrong, as they sometimes will, And when the road you've trudged or trudging seems all uphill, when the funds are low and the debts are high and you want to smile but you have to sigh, when the care is pressing you down a bit, rest if you must, but don't you Life is strange with its twists and turns, and every one of us, as every one of us sometimes learns. And many a failure comes about when he might have won had he stuck it out. Don't give up, though. Or don't give up, though the pace seems slow. You may succeed with another blow. Success is failure turned inside out, the silver tint of the clouds of doubt, and you never can tell just how close you are. It may be near when it seems so far, so stick to the fight when your heart is hit. It's when things seem worse that you must not quit. And I just want to encourage you, every single one of you tonight, don't get weary in well-doing. Don't give up when you see everything happening on the news. Just commit to God to walk humbly with him and watch how he will transform your life into what it was ultimately meant to be. I promise you, you'll never regret that. Miss Nett will come. Every head bowed, every eye closed. She should play a verse of invitation. And if the Lord's dealing on your heart, the altar's open.